powerful boy must save a world where humanity has been destroyed. If you dig my recaps don't forget to subscribe and smash that notification bell. After humanity won a bloody war Kai Secutavento is sent to a parallel world where humans were defeated in that conflict. Facing an entity unsure whether it's an angel or a demon the hero is surprised to see this being asking for help from him a human. After all in his world humanity waged an endless battle against the four enemy races but in this alternate world no one remembers who he is. As usual Kai leaves his vehicle to monitor the cemetery for exactly 300 seconds. Impatient his companion companions wait for the job to be done, because methodical as always he doesn't compromise on a single second. Through his binoculars he observes one of the pillars of the conflict caused by the demons who wield enormous magical power. On the other side of the trench angels and elves are considered half-human celestial beings. Among them spirits are deeply involved in this war creatures with special types of bodies. Additionally mythical beasts such as dragons ravage the battlefields with their unparalleled ferocity. Together with human Humanity, all these beings started a widespread conflict known as the Great War of the Five Races. Kai as one of the soldiers of the Urza Federation cannot allow this clash to reignite. That's why he relentlessly monitors the cemetery where the demons were sealed. After completing the 300 seconds of observation, the young soldier returns to the Urza vehicle and leaves. Frustrated Ashran remarks that no demon has escaped the seal in 100 years, but Kai emphasizes that their job as the Human Protection Agency is to ensure that it never happens. Ashrin argues that there are four cemeteries like this around the world and it doesn't help if they're the only ones taking this job seriously. His colleague has no doubt that everyone gives their best to do a good job because a demon escape would cause an unprecedented catastrophe. Saki, the woman on the team, tries to calm their friend, making it clear that everything is peaceful, but he doesn't want to lower his guard for a moment. After the trip, they return to Vishal and the Urza Federation where the branch that employs employs the three of them is located. In one of the training sessions alongside an unconscious Ashran Kai uses a mythical beast type machine dummy and is warned by the system that it's extremely risky to fight an opponent of this level as a low ranking soldier. Ignoring the warning the soldier attacks the mechanical beast's ankle but causes no damage. When the dragon is about to swallow him Saki turns off the robot and ends the combat training. Worried she warns that he will end up dying if he continues at this insane pace but Kai believes he needs to push his limits to make the practice worthwhile. For these reasons and others the girl believes that this boy would have gone down in history if he had been born in the era of the Great War of the Five Races just like the Prophet Sid. Kai feels honored by the compliment but doesn't see himself worthy of such an achievement. As much as the legend is praised among humans, the girl can't imagine that just one man defeated these four heroes. The demon heroine Dark Empress Vanessa, the celestial Lord Alfraya, the spirit Spirit Sovereign Rikujin Kyoko, and the Lord of Mythical Beasts the Fang King Wrath. Despite his partner's disbelief Kai asserts that Sid emerged victorious from this war because of the shining sword given by the prophetic god Arsla Salaka. Nevertheless she points out that there are no photos or videos of the human hero unlike all the others so she remains skeptical about Sid's existence. That said she goes to give Ashran a wake-up poke in the ribs and asks the guys what they want to do to celebrate Jean's promotion. Ashran says a bouquet of flowers will do but Saki points out that the woman is being transferred to the royal capital of Urzak at 17 being the youngest in history to be selected so a few shabby flowers won't do justice to such an achievement. Speaking of her Jean sends a message inviting Kai to meet her tomorrow morning at Terminal 9 in front of the cat statue but asks him to keep it a secret from Saki and Ashran. The two friends start teasing him about this secret romance so he gets riled up and says he's going for a run. The next day he meets Jean because the girl will be transferred next week and doesn't want to miss seeing her friend before then. Besides she thought he was on leave despite the uniform indicating otherwise. He explains that he did his morning training and came straight over so she replies that Kai is the only guy who isn't intimidated by the idea of shopping with her and that's what she likes about him. Jean's idea is to buy a gift for Saki and Ashrin before heading to Urzak since the three of them are probably thinking the same thing and this will be the last time they see each other. Kai thinks this is an exaggeration because the promoted one would return after two years of cadet training in Vishal but Jean recalls that during this time Saki and Ashrin will have finished their military service and will return to civilian life. She believes that only Kai 
will continue in Urza until then and the boy shares this sentiment. Proud of his friend, he assures her that she will surpass even her father in her career, the head of the Urza headquarters. This has been Jean's dream since she was a child and everything she has pursued in life since then. With that said, continuing their outing, the two stop to eat something while the girl thinks about what to get for their friends. After deciding, she thanks Kai for his company. During this conversation, she remembers when the boy got lost in the demon cemetery at 10 years old when his father took him there for inspection. When he got home that day, Kai said he saw Sid's sword. He vividly remembers that day when he fell into an absolute void surrounded by those terrifying creatures until in his free fall, a shining sword illuminated the path and attracted the touch of the young Kai Sakura. Despite the trauma, Kai never shared this story with anyone else believing no one would believe him. Since that incident, he felt a personal responsibility to ensure those demons never escape the cemetery. Because of this mindset, Jean believes the young man will still be with the agency for the protection of humanity in two years. Speaking of which, she asks him what he thinks the future holds beyond those two years. But before he can answer, Kai sees the world around him slowly crumbling. Amidst this static distortion, some sort of system announces that global reincarnation has been activated. With that, Kai Secured Vento is transported to an alternate world where the buildings in his city Vishal had all been destroyed and a dark war-torn environment had taken over. Above it all a gigantic demon appears behind the buildings and attacks him with its magic. Managing to escape death and without time to reflect on everything Kai runs towards his rifle and fires at the demon's new spell with a modified elven bullet cancelling the spell and surprising his opponent. Enraged the creature charges at the man again requiring great dodging skills from Kai who manages to overcome the obstacles and strike the enemy with his bayonet. The demon's skin was extremely tough rendering the blade useless. However the Urza soldier fires again at the demon this time with a modified draconic bullet that reproduces the breath of mythical beasts. After causing a tremendous explosion in the target's body Kai takes pride in having executed the moves he trained to defeat a demon. Indignant another evil entity appears unable to believe a human defeated one of its kind and Kai notices that the being can speak human language surprisingly well. The demon emphasizes that the easiest way to command a slave is by communicating in their language, and this statement shocks Kai making him realize he must be the scum of this world. The demon senses danger in the boy and conjures a spell to kill him until Saki arrives with the Urza jeep, throws a flash grenade at the entity, and saves her friend. With that done Kai shouts his friend's name, but Saki doesn't know why this stranger knows her name. Similarly Kai approaches Ashran but he also doesn't know who the boy is. Not understanding anything, the protagonist recalls that the three of them were part of the same unit at the Agency for the Protection of Humanity. But Saki also doesn't know what agency that is because she's a soldier of the Resistance, the Rebel Human Army. Increasingly confused, Kai asks what happened to this world, and the girl explains that there was a long battle called the Great War of the Five Races and Humanity was defeated over 30 years ago. Each city in the world was invaded by the enemy races and since then the surviving humans have been hiding as best they can. According to Ashran the other races are still fighting over the conquered territories and the Urza Federation was taken over by demons forcing all residents to flee. However taking advantage of an underground area that survived the war intact humans produced a refuge to live in. Kai questions how humanity lost this battle and the two resistance soldiers explain that they were no match for such powerful creatures and each race has its its own hero unlike humans. Kai asks about the prophet Sid, but neither of them has any idea who that is. The lost boy claims he's the hero who defeated the other four races, but Ashran believes he wouldn't be living underground if this guy really existed. Around the three, the main troop of the underground city arrives. As some cities still resist, each has a garrison supervised by the main troop. According to Saki and Ashran, the commander of this troop, and the resistance is seen as a savior by the people of the Urza Federation. His name is Jean, an empathetic and charismatic leader embraced by human civilization. Among the commanded, Jean asks who the unknown soldier is, and while his colleagues explain Kai is speechless realizing that even his best friend doesn't know who he is. The boy can't let it go so he shouts Jean's name and remembers that the two were shopping just a few minutes ago. The commander asks what this story is because he doesn't know this soldier, then turns back and heads to a scheduled meeting. Not satisfied, 
terrified Kai questions why his friend is pretending to be a man as her dream as a daughter was always to surpass her father's career. Phelan one of the leader's subordinates grabs Kai by the wrist but Jean asks her to release him. After the commander's departure Saki asks what's going on in the kid's head and Ashran lends his room to the boy to rest a bit and get his mind in order. Upon arriving at Ashran's house the visitor to this world can't think of anything other than why all this is happening to him. No matter how much he reads the documents the only missing records are his and Sid's. What Kai doesn't understand is that if Prophet Sid never lived there shouldn't be the four cemeteries to seal the four races. The next day Kai questions his old friends about the cemeteries but they know nothing of the sort. Faced with this Kai borrows the car and promises to return by noon. Despite Saki's protests Ashran reflexively tosses the key to the stranger and Kai heads for the chaotic destruction of Vishal until he reaches the cemetery he monitored in the original world. As he approaches the entrance he encounters Prophet Sid's sword and wields it. A voice from the weapon decrees that the bearer of this relic has now become the code holder. With that Kai is taken to a place where an angelic being yearns for help. With some effort the woman manages to say her name is Rin. Despite the inhuman situation in which this entity finds herself Kai doesn't want to risk freeing a demon, but since he can't just leave her behind he hopes she won't attack. He uses his blade to break the chain but nothing happens. He tries his rifle but not even a shot causes any damage. With that Kai imagines he could use the sword he found in the cemetery and even though it wasn't his intention Sid's weapon manifests in his hands making it clear it's the way. With a simple Simple strike the chains shatter returning freedom to the prisoner. Regaining consciousness Rin is startled and pulls away from the human's lap then angrily shouts the name Vanessa demanding her return and claiming she hasn't lost this fight. Disregarding Kai Rin declares she cannot be defeated by a mere lackey demon and attacks the human. After dodging the first spell the combatant sees a large mass of magical energy forming in front of him ready to fly at him when the system's voice indicates that the code bearer must cut off the fate of death. Using his blade, the young human slashes the entity's spell in half, leaving her incredulous. Rin questions how a weak demon could destroy her attacks, so Kai turns his back to prove he is human, as he has neither wings nor a tail. Realizing the situation, Rin apologizes for her behavior, explaining that her hatred for demons makes her act impulsively. As Rin claims not to be a demon, Kai asks about her species, but the woman doesn't seem comfortable with the question and asks to leave it aside. Accepting the terms Kai now wants to know where they are, but Rin herself doesn't know as she was fighting Vanessa, and simply ended up there. Alarmed the human asks if she's talking about the Dark Empress and heroine of demons as that's no ordinary rival. Rin affirms she is capable of devastating an entire army of demons but emphasizes what she just saw from this young boy. After all he destroyed one of her spells. Kai was about to explain that the responsible one was the sword he carried when in the meantime a robotic woman announces that the singular destiny entity has awakened and that its threat level to the new established world is gigantic. For this reason the robot initiates the sealing through last risers. With that said the machine attacks Kai and Rin with all its might and as the structure around them is shattered they try to keep their distance but the machine uses its portal to reach the targets and grab Rin. After doing so it initiates code zero where magical orbs are conjured and injure the victim's body. Body. Seeing this before his eyes Kai refuses to stand still and reacts with Sid's sword cutting the metallic claw that held the singular destiny entity in half. The machine is stunned upon seeing the forbidden sword and while Rin sees Sid's image reflected in Kai the boy teleports them both to a distant location. Safe Rin confesses her fear with a strong hug to her savior a gesture the human reciprocates. Analyzing the circumstances he asks if the woman has no companions and indeed she has no one. In fact, it's the first time someone has done something like this for her. Both celestial spirits and beasts said that Rin is not like them, and the demons were the cruelest of all saying the girl is an abomination. That's why Rin ended up in a duel with their leader Vanessa. Similarly, Kai identifies with the entity's life story as no one remembers who he is in this world. As far as he knew humans had won the Great War of the Five Races, but now he sees the city which was once his home crumbled into ruins. Rin confesses she didn't know that especially since a little before fighting Vanessa humans were starting to win the war after the appearance of a hero. Hearing this
this Kai asks if the girl knows Sid, but she doesn't remember anyone by that name. Still, the man is content to have a companion and share a familiar story with someone. Happy with this idea, Rin had never heard anyone call her a companion, and this strengthens the bond between the two lost beings in this dark universe. As they begin their journey, Rin faints, making the boy carry her on his shoulder. He says they need to pass through the city, and though she doesn't generally trust humans, she trusts Kai, so she goes with him. Later, already lying in bed, Kai feels the weight of his own body after the torturous day. As if that weren't enough on the way to the city, Rin panicked in the car. And though she can hide her wings from the people, she still draws much attention with her strange behavior. Hearing Rin singing in the shower, Kai never imagined that other races knew how to sing. Suddenly, she runs out in a towel to alert him that the water has stopped flowing. Speaking of which, she considers humans very unfair for having this hot water to bathe in while all her life she had to bathe in the cold waters of rivers and lakes. Furthermore, Kai's bed is so soft while she spent her entire life sleeping on underbrush and rocks. However, as she herself saw on the surface, now this human city has turned to ruins just as the man had said. Even he finds it hard to believe he's in a world where the historical outcome of the Great War has been reversed. Rin bets they will find a way out of there and return to the world they came from, and for now hope is the only thing they have. When it's time to sleep Rin lies in a warm bed for the first time while Kai tries to rest on the floor as best he can, however his rest is interrupted when the girl alerts him to the strong presence of magic in the surroundings firmly stating that there's a demon nearby. In fact the city's sound system announces an enemy attack is happening and all civilians must evacuate. Stepping into the street Kai laments that even one of humanity's last refuges is in danger confirming his belief that his race is cornered with no one to save them. However, from what he experienced yesterday, he believes he might be the only person capable of at least imitating Sid in wielding the Forbidden Sword. Armed with this trump card, he heads into battle. Meanwhile, Saki and Ashran are already on the front lines firing at the demons, but the creature's tough armor prevents them from being injured. Ashran asks his comrade to grab the machine gun. On her way, the girl is almost killed by one of the enemies, but Kai appears in time to save Saki. After striking the demon hard, he tells her to use water against the opponents. When they absorb the liquid their stone bodies become heavy preventing them from flying. After that it's a matter of bombing the enemies until they turn to ashes. Speaking of which it seemed like it was Ashran's turn to die but Kai manages to help again just in time. With Sid's sword in hand, the boy seems to be on a much higher level than he ever expected and this sudden power is what has so far balanced the forces between the two races. With Rin's help the duo manages to take down the last opponent and the extraordinary ability of that entity makes the human realize she could indeed face Vanessa. Even so part of the city is devastated and structures housing the population are in flames. Terrified Saki and Ashran arrive with a thousand questions about how Kai was able to do all that. He reveals that he came from a world where humans won this conflict and the fighting style from his world along with special ammunition are technological advancements that helped secure this victory. The two fighters from this universe were about to question the crazy story, but suddenly Ashran is informed by the surveillance team that two demon scouts escaped. Without delay, the fighter runs to alert the headquarters already foreseeing the worst because now the demons know where the refuge is and will return with even more units next time. Saki asks Kai to accompany them to the HQ because Jean could use his strength in this war, so he agrees. On the way Kai asks if the rebel army HQ of the Urza Federation isn't in the ruined royal capital, but Ashran believes that precisely because of this the demons would never think humans are there. Saki explains that this idea came from the former commander Jean's father who retired two years ago due to an injury passing the title to his son. Some time later at headquarters, the officers can't believe the man, and the entity came from an alternate world where the war was one and Jean wants to know the relationship between her and Kai in this different world since he spoke to her as if he knew her. Kai then explains they were childhood friends and Jean always said she wanted to be like Og and Jur. Hearing these names Jean is shocked and ends the meeting right there. At night Phelan knocks on Kai's door to inform him that the commander is waiting for him. Upon arrival the boy sees his friend without her male disguise and she reveals that only Phelan and the veteran directors know she is 
a woman. She then expresses surprise that Kai knows the nicknames of her father and grandfather Og and Jur. For this reason despite not believing everything she considers the possibility that the stranger is telling the truth and asks for his help to contact the other five resistance centers and encircle the demons intending to invade the neo visual Refuge. Rin argues that even if the mission succeeds it would only provoke the demons further who would retaliate with even more force but Jean sees no other option. Thus Kai suggests they attack the royal capital targeting the Dark Empress Vanessa. Thinking the man is crazy the commander reminds him that this demon was responsible for decimating the entire capital defense army 30 years ago and occupying the palace. In response Kai mentions Sid Story who defeated the demon's heroine alone and feels he can do the same. Skeptical of the young fighter, the commander asks why he seems so willing to risk his life for this mission. He emphasizes that he saw Ashran and Saki risking their necks in battle, and even if he returned to his original world, he wouldn't be able to face them if he left them to die in the alternate world. Finally, he devises a plan based on the perception that demons are more concerned with other races than with humans. Thus, most of their forces are stationed near the borders, and probably only about 10% of the total demonic forces are in the royal capital. He suggests that while he fights Vanessa, the rebel army keeps these 10% occupied. Jean agrees they can hold the enemies for a while, but fears most of her troops will be dead before reaching the palace. In light of this Phelan suggests they invade from underground, because behind the palace there is a subterranean railway line that the royal family used as an escape route. Surprised, Jean asks why she wasn't informed about this railway before, and the fighter replies that Jean's father didn't want her to risk herself to that extent, so he asked the subordinates to omit this strategy. With that said, the commander announces a meeting to finally retake the Urza Federation. As preparations for the attack near completion Rin reflects on her hatred for demons because they are deceitful spirits, because they are bizarre mythical beasts, because they are barbaric celestials, because they are stubborn and humans because they are weak. But above all she hates herself for being a mix of all of them. Nonetheless she acknowledges that Kai has never feared her even embracing her something she had never experienced before being accustomed to receiving hatred. For this reason Rin deeply wishes that this human does not die. As the battle vehicles depart the rebel army of the Urza Federation heads toward the government palace through an underground passage to launch their offensive. While the main group is to keep the demons occupied Saki and her team need to free the captives in the basement and take down Vanessa. At the top of the hierarchy Jean gives the orders and Saki Saki sees in her leader the chance for victory to be real. Her only concern is the fact that she will be in the group facing the demon heroine head-on. In a spontaneous outburst, she questions whether the four members in the armored vehicle will be able to complete such a difficult mission. Kai emphasizes that the priority is to reach Vanessa as quickly as possible and hold out until reinforcements arrive not to storm the palace like Rambo and take out the enemy leader with a bow and arrow. Moreover, Kai has already demonstrated his strength in the previous conflict and trusts only Saki and Ashrin to accompany him on this mission. Saki doesn't seem any calmer hearing this so Rin pats her head to try to make a difference. Surprised, Saki calms down. The entity points out that she is also powerful enough to face the enemy forces, although Vanessa is a formidable opponent. If the Empress of Darkness insists on not dying, Rin is prepared to self-destruct and take the demon along. Unfortunately, this last part doesn't seem to have made Saki any calmer. Similarly, Ashran confesses to being worried since no one knows what the palace will be like when they arrive especially with the rebels moving with so many people making it easier for them to be discovered by the enemies. Regarding this Kai reminds them that demons are sensitive to magic and that humans do not possess magical power which could camouflage the men until they reach the target location. Ashran calms down a bit at this information and adds that all the rebels will be remembered forever because of this mission perhaps even even well rewarded. Hearing this Kai comments that this Ashran is stronger than the one from his original world and Ashran questions if that is some kind of compliment. Soon upon reaching the end of the 
underground passage Jean gathers all the comrades of the rebel army and thanks them for the trust placed in their leader. The commander emphasizes the bravery and loyalty of these soldiers who are humanity's last hope and acknowledges that many must feel insecure with a little time for preparation for this attack. However, she reminds them that the Urza Federation's resistance is not new. Years of intense battles against the domination of demons have left each one of them with war scars evidence that only seasoned soldiers are in this front line and this hardened spirit is the key to freeing humans from the clutches of darkness. With that said, the soldiers raise their weapons and let out a battle cry. After blowing up the exit of the underground passage, they reach the surface and see the government palace surrounded by demonic forces. The first act of defense is to invoke a freezing spell, but Kai knows this ability and successfully dispels it. Then he shoots the demon and gets close enough to tear its skin with his sword. Finally, a shot explodes the enemy. As soon as the first demon is taken down, more emerge to protect the palace, so the jewel of the Urza Federation fires the lightning bullet to take down several at once. In disbelief at what he saw, Ashran questions if it was Kai responsible for this massacre, and he explains that he used anti-group ammunition produced in his world. Then the mysterious stranger asks Rin to sense Vanessa's presence, and as soon as the entity points to the possible location of the Empress of Darkness Kai announces that he will start the search from the highest floor on the north side. To avoid attracting too much attention Jean plans to invade the palace using the emergency stairs on the south side with her team, while Group 1 will stand guard at the entrance to prevent the demons from entering the building. Group 2 will be responsible for rescuing the prisoners in the basement. During the building invasion Phelan finds it strange that Kai claims the lightning bullet is a projectile when he didn't even pull any trigger, but the matter dies without her being able to delve into this suspicion as the objective demands all the combatants' attention. As they climb the stairs Rin identifies an imp, a race of small demons that summon large-scale demons. Without delay a huge creature appears on the staircase and grabs one of the rebels, but Phelan is faster and cuts the beast's fingers. After that she orders everyone to continue climbing while she holds off the demon. At the palace entrance group 1 shoots the attackers as best they can while group 2 reaches the prisoners in the basement. The main team continues on their way with the commander in the lead until she is hit by an electric trap that makes all the soldiers apprehensive. However, when the smoke clears, Jean proceeds unharmed and asks everyone to calm down as she is protected by elven engineering while wearing the holy light suit. Beside the leader, a huge demon approaches, so she orders Kai and his unit to go after Vanessa while she fights the opponent with her men. Known as the Knight of the Holy Light, Jean brandishes her blade before the opponent. Further ahead, Kai's group wears an armband produced from Rin's magic that conceals the wearer's presence. Continuing on their way they encounter a gigantic creature that makes Saki's rifle tremble so Rin tries to control her companion's anxiety so she doesn't make noise. Protected by a barrier invisible to the demon the humans breathe a sigh of relief as the beast passes without detecting the intruders. With that everyone exhales in relief and heads to one of the palace rooms where the circuit breakers are located. Ashrin declares that if Kai and Rin fail to defeat Vanessa he and Saki will cut all all the lights to facilitate everyone's escape. However, shortly after Kai and Rin continue their journey, the palace alarm is triggered despite Rin's barrier still functioning leading the boy to suppose that the building's infrared sensors are still active. For this reason, they pick up the pace encountering a demon who expresses disgust at Rin's wings calling them a chaotic and unpleasant sight. Taking advantage of the demon's tendency to talk, Kai asks if he is the one maintaining the surveillance system, but the monster never directs directly answers what the human wants to know. Instead he provokes them by saying that Vanessa is pleased with this invasion and above all curious to know why the humans have decided to kill themselves. Not falling for the provocation Kai tries to use the opportunity to ask if the demon can lead them to their heroine but the monster doesn't want to miss the chance to have fun with the humans before him. With that the creature and his subordinates summon fireballs against their enemies making Rin hurry to grab Kai and dodge the flames with her her wings. After escaping the first barrage the entity throws the man to the ground and isolates him from the battle with an ice wall so that Kai can continue his path towards Vanessa. With no choice the boy proceeds while the demons smell angelic elven dwarven spirit and dragon scents on the woman and even a demonic odor in that mysterious entity. Confused they ask what she is but even Rin doesn't know. 
All she knows at this moment is that she hates these hideous creatures. Meanwhile, Kai finds a huge gate and enters the throne room where Vanessa welcomes the human. In front of that figure, Kai can't help but tremble slightly. At the same time, Jean faces the gigantic demon but struggles to penetrate the opponent's armor. So she unlocks her weapon's form, revealing the moon longbow, finally piercing the enemy's armor with an arrow. Nearly dead, the demon observes that the intense elven magic this human is using gradually consumes her life as humans are not prepared to handle this kind of influence. For this reason, the demon believes the commander has chosen death. Jean then drives her sword into the demon's head and confirms that she has chosen to die because only then will humanity be able to win this war. Suddenly another enemy attacks her from behind but Phelan returns in time and repels the threat for a moment. The three-headed hellhound rises again and notes that he has heard of Dragonar, a human who fights using a dragon's fang as a weapon just like Phelan. Meanwhile Vanessa asks if Kai is not going to put down his weapon as many others did upon discovering that the demon leader is a succubus. That way she could lie with him to pass the time. Kai refuses the proposal and states that the nature of the demon is madness driven by violence. Vanessa laughs and acknowledges that the boy reacted well because many become her slaves with just a simple charm like this. She then asks if the human present is the rebel commander wearing the elven suit but Kai claims he is just an outsider from a world where Vanessa was defeated. Though skeptical the Empress asks who managed to bring her down in that story, and Kai says it was the humans. Faced with all the infinitely more dangerous threats, Vanessa laughs even more upon hearing that she died at the hands of a human. Then Kai explains that it wasn't just any human but the prophet Sid. Hearing this name, Vanessa loses all her grace because that name reminds her of many unpleasant things like the code holder and the world reincarnation. With that, she changes her stance and attacks the human with magic. But Kai breaks the spell with little difficulty leaving Vanessa incredulous. Without giving her a chance to think the man counterattacks with his sword and slashes the opponent's chest but it was just a succubus illusion. Behind the human the real empress of darkness nearly blows him up. Vanessa praises the enemy's ability to dodge and the weapon he carries which besides nullifying magic unleashes an attack similar to a dragon's breath. This makes her start to believe that this individual really came from another world. More cautious she invokes glory a purgatory in the form of flames that pulverizes the wall behind the human, but Kai manages to escape. Irritated, she promises to end the fight by conjuring the chaos explosion, which shatters the entire building's floor in a devastating blast, shaking every part of the structure. Sovereign in the skies, Vanessa assumes there is no being capable of escaping this attack unless it is a hero of the five races. However, Kai Secura Vento remains standing before her. Frightened Kai imagines that Sid's sword Sword saved him once again. Then Rin arrives with several wounds after fearing that Kai had died until a portal opens in the sky and metallic claws hold Vanessa. A metallic voice announces that it detected unexpected fluctuations in the demon heroine after Vanessa heard the word Sid. For this reason, the robot initiates an excision by Last Riser to erase Vanessa's code from the world, but the Empress of Darkness reacts with the glory ability. According to the succubus, she will not be defeated by a mere alpha fry a hound. Taking tremendous damage, the robot retreats back to the portal leaving Kai and Rin terrified by the strength the demon heroine demonstrated. Rin notes that Vanessa has always been strong, but the one from the other world was not as terrifying as this one. Irritated, the Empress notices that some wounds on her body are not healing, but that doesn't change the fact that she is going to crush the two opponents before her. Suddenly, in an utterly unthinkable move, Rin grabs Vanessa and orders Kai to flee. Then she conjures the shadow prison and the demonic leader recognizes it as the spirit's barrier but never for a moment did she think she could be immobilized by such a fragile spell. With that she shatters the barrier and sends Rin flying. Without giving the angel a chance to react the dark empress prepares the spell that will end the fight. However Kai reacts just in time to catch the opponent's attention but not to stop her. All Vanessa does is direct the magic towards the human who suffers the overwhelming power of the demon's spell. After the impact, seeing her friend bloodied and motionless against the wall, the angel thinks the worst has truly happened. Having done this, Vanessa asserts with conviction that the man is dead questioning whether the angel will seek revenge or try to escape alone. But Rin ignores the enemy's arrogance and rises again, healing her wounds as she does. Letting fury course through her body like blood in her veins, 
remains, the sinister and inexplicable entity takes on a feral form with sharp claws on each finger and an imposing black wing unfurling from her back. Vanessa observes that this looks like a mix of the five races but her opponent is not in the mood for conversation. Consumed by rage Rin flies towards Vanessa and punches her in the stomach then continues with a flurry of blows that hit the demon directly. All Rin wants is to shut this woman up and she won't stop until she gets what she desires. However, Vanessa shows she hasn't surrendered in this fight by grabbing her adversary's fist. After letting out a laugh, she starts blaming Kai's death on her arguing that if she had taken this form earlier, she could have prevented her friend's demise. Vanessa deduces that her rival was trying at all costs to hide her true identity, but understands the reason considering that humans are weak and cowardly. In the succubus's opinion, humans fear demons, hate mythical beasts, run from spirits and envy the celestials. Speaking of humanity, Vanessa hasn't forgotten what she said earlier. Suspecting that Rin is a mix of all races, it's clear she would have her human part which cries out of fear and resentment when called a monster. In the end, Vanessa states that her opponent didn't prevent her companion's death because she didn't want to having hesitated when she should have reacted and now the damage is done. Trying to hold back her emotions, Rin agrees that it's her fault but that it no longer matters. Whether she regrets it or not she knows nothing will bring the man back. On the other hand, she can act against Vanessa, and that's what she does. Rin then warns that both of them will die together, as she recites words in a strange language that lead to the birth of a curse which creeps into every crevice of their bodies and makes every part of them bleed. According to Rin, these drops represent their lives lives that drip slowly like a poorly closed faucet. However, even though she was convinced she would kill Vanessa and herself, the mysterious entity's magic simply dissipates. Vanessa recalls that even a curse requires mana, and since since this place is her lair, she prepared a long-range spell that prevents any magic from spirits, mythical beasts, and celestials. Being the heir of these three races, Rin will suffer the curse's effect three times more than this magic circle carries. Faced with these facts, Rin lowers her head as if accepting her end and Vanessa takes advantage of her irreversible advantage to belittle her adversary, stating that she is a race less aberration that should never have been born. Without strength to react, Rin cries and asks Kai for forgiveness, and even her enemy's last words irritate the Dark Empress's ears, prompting her to conjure a fire spell on her. However, when the smoke clears, Kai is protecting the allied entity with Sid's sword, extinguishing the flames that spread across the ground. With a smile on his face, he explains that the girl doesn't need to apologize, because without her, he would have already died. Vanessa argues that no human can survive after being hit by her close-range magic, so Kai looks at his sword immediately. It was obviously the sword that saved the man from his own destruction once again. Now it would have to continue proving its worth as Vanessa keeps launching spells at its wielder. Moreover, she uses the same tactic she used against Rin trying to mess with her opponent's head through words claiming that Kai is just an insignificant trash who doesn't know when to die and that his friend was ridiculously defeated. But it is precisely for this reason that Kai rises before the Empress once more. Rin risked her life to save him, and the human doesn't want to simply let that go. Seeing that she won't win this battle with words, Vanessa goes back to attacking her opponents, this time with a gust of wind that prevents their movement. Having done this, she recounts that she knows humans very well, as they are all the same, always shouting from the rooftops that they have great potential, and that it will be shown in the future. But that future never arrives. On the other hand, the leaders of all other races wield their power through strength and respect earned through their abilities. Vanessa considers them all heroes. However, to her humans have no heroes unless Kai sees himself as one. Attentive to every word without lowering his guard, the human responds that he has no interest in becoming the leader of his race, but that the spirit of humanity resides within him as it does in all men of this world. Kai may not be a hero, but he is the one standing before the enemy, and thus he will not leave there alive unless he has defeated the Empress of Darkness. In response, Vanessa continues to escalate 
escalate the fight. She now invokes a magic circle that conjures the demon planet, a massive meteor surrounded by flames. Kai being the holder of the code reacts with his magic sword and slices the planet in half from a distance. Vanessa doesn't lose confidence because she is certain she will be the only one to leave there alive. To ensure this, she reveals the flowers of the underworld blooming like flames scattered across the sky. At this moment Kai instructs Ashrin to turn off the breaker plunging the area into darkness. Considering that humans have no magical abilities they cannot be sensed in the dark by the demon but Vanessa manages to see the glow of Sid's sword being carried by someone presumably Kai. Without hesitation, she launches her fiery flowers at the human like a burning rain. But it was Rin waiting for the enemy to take the bait, having all the protection prepared to handle such an attack and create a distraction. Meanwhile, taking advantage of the opening caused, Kai prepares to execute what he has trained for over 10 years. After punching Vanessa, he receives Sid's sword from Rin and informs his opponent that she is in checkmate. As a last move on the board, the demon heroine offers Urza back to the human, but without responding, he delivers the final blow. Afterward, Vanessa is still alive, but acting strangely. With great effort, she remembers the prophet Sid and questions how she could have made such a foolish mistake. According to her, Sid foresaw the world's reincarnation, which would be a chapter in history where the world would be rewritten, recreated. One day, someone made this transformation happen, and Vanessa believes it to be one of the three heroes who must be found. Given this Sid gave his sword to Vanessa to prepare for what is to come. One of the Empress of Darkness's measures was to hide the relic, because it is the only key to correct the world's change. Confused Kai responds that Vanessa and Sid should be enemies as any record of the Great War would suggest. Vanessa acknowledges that she fought against the human hero, but insists that there are many things Kai doesn't know about this world, things that operate freely like some sort of forbidden code. As an example she mentions the zero Zero code, but does not go into details. She then finally recognizes the human spirit after everything she has witnessed in this fight, seeing that the two companions fought more for each other than for themselves. With that, the succubus slowly disintegrates towards the moon, while her soul promises to love Kai intensely in the next life, considering that their only meeting in this world was brief and fatal. When it is all over, Kai collapses. He can hardly believe that the demon heroine is dead, and that he and Rin survived. With the arrival of the morning all units are informed that the rebel army of Urza commanded by the Knight of the Sacred Light Jean Annis has reclaimed the royal capital Urzak by defeating the demon leader. Amid the most important news of the war, so far Saki and Ashrin sleep like angels. Meanwhile, the main contributors to the victory discuss the last words of the Empress of Darkness. According to her something that turned the world upside down affected everyone except Kai and Rin. At that moment Jean appears and apologizes for the unpleasant sight of the destroyed buildings, but acknowledges that without the help of the two, they wouldn't even have this. On behalf of the rebels, the Knight of the Sacred Light thanks them for their service, though she senses that the two honorees are not very happy. In fact, Kai explains that it is a feeling of relief because in a second encounter with Vanessa, they might not have been lucky enough to leave alive. Jean understands the sentiment and emphasizes that the capital will return to what it was 30 years ago, perhaps even better. However, she warns that she will leave this reconstruction to the executives as she herself will leave Urza. The reason is that there are three main federations that have been conquered. The Federation of Eo to the east, the Federation of Yulun to the south, and the Federation of Shuls to the west. One federation was conquered by the Celestials while the spirits and mythical beasts each took one. Rebel groups are fighting bravely to expel each occupying force and Jean will assist these groups in an attempt to achieve total union among all humans. After all the death of the demon heroine ignited a flame throughout the world. That's why the commander wants Kai's presence in this action, because this is the hope of ending the great war of the five races. With the end of his friend's speech Kai is moved by how incredible she is because the gene he knew also had ambitions but had a more childish side. In any case, she was a kind person concerned with doing good for her friends like the gifts she liked to buy for them for example. Intrigued Jean can't imagine herself doing the 
these things as she lives in a world surrounded by chaos and destruction. Then Kai asks if the rebel commander could assist him in his fight to defeat the remaining three leaders as this would create a true alliance to fight side by side besides being part of the victory in the war. Without hesitation Jean shakes the combatant's hand and Rin places her hand on top as she will not miss this journey. With the agreement sealed the human leader returns to her soldiers and announces the convening of a war council. Among them Ashrin and Saki seemed light-hearted and happy with the reconquest of the royal capital as did everyone else. Nearby Kai promises Rin that he will put an end to this war and that if there is no hero in this dimension he will assume that role himself. Thus he will go after whoever caused the world's reincarnation. As the boy spoke Rin could see the silhouette of the prophet sit around him as if he were the one speaking. In her mind as she fled from that sinister machine chasing after her Rin imagined a human hero rescuing her in his arms. But this was just a sudden fantasy as she roamed the remote lands of that lost world aboard the rebel's armored vehicle. Ashran felt so cold he thought he'd catch a cold before reaching the EO Federation. Alongside his team dozens of other vehicles followed their path under Jean's leadership. With little patience for his comrades' complaints Saki reminded them that there was an urgent plea for help coming from the other federations and that their convoy carried humanity's last hope. Kai just hoped the capital was truly rebuilt by the time they returned while Rin prayed the city would be safe from the demons. Before leaving Urzak the fighters had organized to pick up the pieces and rebuild this crucial region for humanity. Unfortunately Rin could smell the demons from afar circling the perimeter soon forming a barrier around the central palace. Leading the visit Vanessa's sister spotted the one who had sent her sister back to hell. Kai used his code bearer ability to shield himself from one of the demon's attacks, but Anne had to intervene to prevent harm from coming to the fighter. Kai asked the demon's intentions and she introduced herself as Heinmarill while the human felt a pressure from this succubus as potent as Vanessa's. Heinmarill believed her sister had been defeated by a mere man due to a series of miracles but that wouldn't have happened if she had been present at the battle. Kai wondered if the demon had come for revenge for her sister, provoking a laugh from Heinmarill. According to her Vanessa's absence propelled her to the top of the demon hierarchy despite her fondness for the Dark Empress. In fact, she was grateful to the human for eliminating Vanessa. Speaking of which, she revealed she had come to discuss business. If the demons gathered Heinmarill believed they could reclaim the capital whenever they wanted, but they were allowing the humans to keep Urzak on purpose. The deal was to let the humans have the city in exchange for a truce, and the fighter agreed to pass the proposal to the commander. Heinmarill taunted Rin telling the chaotic being to stop looking at her, which infuriated that unknown entity. By the way Heinmarill hoped the humans would fight the other three races and Kai knew she wanted to use the humans to attack the others while the demons recovered from their last defeat. Heinmarill admitted this without ceremony and offered the soldier a kiss if he performed well on this mission. Moreover, if they planned to go to the Celestial Lands Vanessa's sister advised them to be wary of Lord Alfreya, who had been behaving strangely lately. After the whole event Kai commented inside the armored vehicle that the reconstruction unit was responsible for a perilous Urzak. Being part of the expedition unit, he and the other team members had to cooperate with the EO Federation and defeat the Celestials. Comprising elves, dwarves, fairies, and angels, Kai believed these races were more cunning and cowardly than humans being creators of powerful magical items for wartime. If humans consider demons as monsters certainly the Celestials were like superior men. Meanwhile Jean alerted via radio that everyone would take a rest stop in two miles. Suddenly Rin warned of a mythical beast approaching on the horizon prompting Kai to alert all vehicles of the enemy's arrival. Descending from the skies with its monstrous size, a dragon stirred the air with the vastness of its wings while the humans reacted with their automatic rifles. Despite this, the mystical beast's tough hide kept it unscathed on its path soon ready to take down the first armored vehicle with its tail. Only when Kai responded with his lightning bullet followed by a joint attack with Rin was significant damage inflicted on the opponent, not enough to kill but enough to cause the dragon to flee. At the same moment Jean ordered the entire convoy to stop to rescue groups 29 and 30, which had been hit by the mythical beast. Later gathered for the rest period Kai felt bad for having such a large tent just for him and Rin, but she would certainly be tense alongside humans, she didn't know perhaps why Jean allowed her to stay alone with Kai. At that moment the commander arrived with Phelan to thank him for the excellent work on the hilltop 
and explained that this tent was intended for the high command with the two soldiers serving as the commander's bodyguards. Phelan called Kai to assign the fighter to the inside guard as Jean risked being discovered as a woman if she stayed too long with another woman needing to remove her armor to sleep. To the point the leader's trusted officer ordered the soldier not to make any sudden movements when seeing the commander in her casual clothes. Kai felt offended being a professional soldier on duty, but as he entered reality began to hit him. Rin was giving Jean a back massage to relieve pain, and Kai took the chance to comment on how difficult it must be to pretend to be a man. Changing the subject he declared he hadn't expected the presence of a mythical beast in the Urza Federation, assuming they might have come to explore the area after learning of the Dark Empress's fall. Jean reassured her subordinate reminding him that defenses had been prepared in the royal capital and the post wouldn't be taken easily. She then mentioned that she moved a lot in her sleep, so the soldier was warned in case he felt a kick in the middle of the night. Speaking of which, while the tent was large there wasn't room for three people in the bed. At dawn, the convoy sets off to continue its mission. Ashran imagines that Kai didn't get much sleep since he's the commander's bodyguard. The boy with exhaustion etched on his face agrees wholeheartedly. Watching the scenery through the window Rin wants to know what that structure resembling the Great Wall of China is and Saki explains that it's the Great Border Wall. In other words, they are close to the EO Federation which Jean confirms to the combatants via radio. The convoy's destination is the 8th city Cassiopeia on the outskirts of the local capital. It's there where the regional army's headquarters is located. By late afternoon the vehicles traverse the ruins of once lively human cities. Saki readies her rifle in case she spots a celestial wanting to strike first this time especially since human weapons are effective against these beings. Kai asks his colleague to tone down her eagerness because humans resemble celestials so there's a risk she might mistakenly shoot an ally. Up ahead, the commander orders the convoy to stop and disembark to continue the journey on foot. Rin gathers local fruits to eat despite Kai being unsure if it's safe to eat anything from the area. The angelic being admits that her tongue goes numb when she bites into them, but the taste is incredible. Kai suspects it's poison, but she says she has eaten this fruit before in the elf forest. The soldier is intrigued by this forest and Jean explains that due to the celestial invasion they buried the human city with the elf forest. Further along the Urza Federation combatants are warmly welcomed by the inhabitants of Cassiopeia along with formal greetings from local soldiers. Obviously no one expected such a warm reception which could be as good as it is bad because the joy over the arrival of reinforcements might mean the threat is more more real than it seems. One of the men steps forward and introduces himself to the commander. His name is Zephan Bakenhain advisor of Cassiopeia. The victory of the Knight of the Sacred Light has spread throughout the EO Federation, bringing hope back to humanity according to the man. Then he greets Phelan happy to be joining a legendary rebel soldier. Due to her extensive combat experience Zephan comments that the two have had a long life although Phelan disagrees, not feeling she's old enough to earn that title. Without further ado Jean asks to be taken to Dante, the city's commander. On the way Zephan asks Phelan what she knows about the local leader, and she knows his name is Dante Gelf Alighieri, a descendant of the ancient royal family of the EO Federation who considers himself an emperor. Moreover, he's a jealous, distrustful, and obsessive man seeing Jean as a threat. Zephan agrees with every word said by the officer, but asks the Urza commander to understand that all of Cassiopeia rejoices at her arrival, even if the self-proclaimed emperor doesn't agree. Soon the reinforcements are received by the assistant commander Kobayari. She informs them that any matters to be discussed with his majesty must go through her first. Upon entering the man's office he complains that the reinforcements arrived late as it was agreed they would arrive this morning. Therefore Dante wants to know if Jean and Annis intended to keep the emperor waiting. Jean explains that their convoy was attacked by a mythical beast costing them time to recover the wounded and repair the vehicles. Despite the just Justification Dante doesn't care for excuses and questions what the Urza commander is doing in another country after reclaiming her royal capital. In his mind Jean intends 
plans to increase her glory by stealing Io's army. This comment strikes directly at the commander, but she remains calm explaining that Dante himself requested the assistance of her forces. He responds that it was his subordinates who did so on their own, but the commander assumes that he still doesn't want to be dominated by celestial beings. Therefore, the individual glory of a leader is not important in the face of this danger. Moreover, she advises the self-proclaimed emperor to note that the credits for expelling the invaders belong neither to her nor him but to the people and their army. Finally, she says plainly that if Dante wants honors for himself, he should behave in a manner worthy of them. After this unpleasant encounter, the reinforcements join the EO officers. Zephin informs them that the elf forest, the dwarf village, the fairy hideout, and the angel court are considered unexplored territories by humans. Since they don't know where the celestial hero is, Jean takes charge of the search for Alfreya, impressing Dante's subordinates who begin to feel envious of the foreigner's courage. She requests reinforcements from the EO army, but the local leader refuses to lend his men. Anticipating his stubbornness, Jean goes further and states that she came to lend her life to those fighting for their lands, earning the trust and respect of this federation's combatants. At night in their camp, the Urza army has to settle for a horrible slop for dinner. Kai's group discusses Dante's assistant Quibairi. Apparently Rin saw something strange about that woman. Soon, when the sun rises again, the soldiers head to the elf forest. Dante comments to his loyal assistant that Jean is an extremely reckless commander, which Quibairi agrees with as always outraged that the other soldiers are feeling motivated by the intruder's recklessness. When Jean returns from her expedition, she plans to make a map of the forest and schedule a strategic meeting. The next day, the commander reveals the elves' patrol routes based on the tracks they found yesterday, and this information allows for the beginning of an attack against the Celestials. Despite Eos soldiers being motivated for battle, Dante is not at all pleased to see his men being swayed by Jean's charisma. Quibairi advises her boss to accomplish a feat grand enough to solidify his position as emperor and suggests that he himself lead the soldiers in the elf forest. Embracing the idea upon giving this notice to his advisor Dante informs them that he already has a flying unit exploring the elf forest. Zephin thinks this might create friction in the coordination between the Urza and Eo armies, but Dante doesn't care. Moreover, he orders this operation to be kept secret. Meanwhile, Rin raises the suspicion that Dante's assistant commander Quibairi is actually not human. If you're enjoying this journey, don't forget to hit that like button. Your support helps motivate me to keep bringing you each episode. Subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss an update. See you in the next episode.